We're in our fifth week of our Worship Together series where we're looking at the life of Daniel. Daniel is this wonderful illustration for us about a life lived under pressure. Uh, Daniel is, uh, is an example of faithfulness when circumstances aren't what we want them to be, when there's all kinds of things working against us, and uh, he's an example for the people of God of how to be uh, faithful in the midst of that, whatever our circumstances, and, and offering a positive contribution to those circumstances regardless, rather than a kind of combative uh, defensiveness. And I love the book of Daniel, especially because I think that so much of it is so relevant to us in our modern world with all of the things that we find, that, that put pressure on us in the ways that we find ourselves under pressure in our lives. Um, but you might, having watched that skit and followed along in Daniel 7, might be wondering, what on earth does any of that have to do with, with my life? How is that dream at all relevant? Uh, it's not like any dream I've ever had. My dreams are far more boring than that. They're usually absent any kind of exciting, um, you know, symbolic metaphor. My dreams just tend to be like I'm worried about this thing, and so I'm, I'm having a dream about that thing going badly. I, I don't have a whole lot of creativity in my dreams. There's not, there's not monsters, but there's also not uh, theological insight either. Which is not to say that it can't happen. Uh, God does, I believe, speak through dreams and through visions. There are friends and family uh, that I know who have, who have experienced God somehow communicating to them uh, in that form. My, my mother became a Christian in the middle of her life in part because of a spiritual journey that was launched because of a distressing dream that she had. Um, missionaries uh, actually describe this as in a fairly well-documented way, particularly in um, countries where uh, there aren't a lot of Christian influence or maybe no Christian churches or people at all, uh, especially in the Muslim world, there's been a pretty well-documented phenomenon of people having dreams of Jesus even though they've never heard of him. Our mission partner, uh, Monty Mowry, who works with the Wa people, which is this uh, ethnic group that exists uh, kind of straddling the border of China and Burma and Thailand, he tells this story that happened to him when he was on a backpacking trip um, through China, and uh, it was actually, ironically, ha- happened shortly after, not long after the time that Central decided that we were going to uh, pray for and support this particular people group on the other side of the world. Uh, Monty was um, backpacking with a friend, and he came upon this man and was asking directions, and this man uh, was really excited, and he said that sometime before that, he had had a vision of two foreigners with strange bundles on their backs who, who came upon his house, and he understood in this vision that he was supposed to listen to every, learn everything he could from the, from the foreigner who spoke Wa. And when he had this, he thought it was probably something that he had eaten because there are no foreigners who, who spoke Wa that he knew of until Monty showed up with his backpack on asking for directions. And this man actually has become one of Monty's closest friends and most reliable mission partners, uh, ministry partners in that part of the world. And so I do believe that God can speak to us um, in, those, in those formats. It's just that for me, my dreams just tend to be about like forgetting my sermon or something like that. I actually did, I did have this one dream once. This was a short while before I was going to run the New York City Marathon, and I'm I'm using these scare quotes because it didn't look a lot like running. But anyway, a couple weeks before I did this marathon, I I had this dream that I was running through the streets of New York, and I couldn't quite tell whether I was on the right path. Um, It wasn't really well marked, so I was just running and hoping I was in the right place, and up ahead I would see, like, groups of people running, and so I'd, like, run up to that spot, and then I'd turn, and I'd try to follow them, and then I'd see another, that same group, like, running a different way, and so I was constantly trying to keep up with these people, and, um, and, and hoping that I was on the right path, but feeling like I was running in circles, and then I looked down, and I saw that I didn't even have a bib on, that I had, like, forgotten to register, and so I had to go all the way back to the beginning. It was very, it was terrible. It was terrible, and maybe actually there is some symbolism in there now that I'm describing it to you, but 
Uh, it was a terrible dream, but it was not as terrible as running the marathon when I was awake. That was, <laughs> that was way worse. And I think that uh, in, in there, there is a connection with Daniel's dream, even though Daniel's dream is a, a whole different kind of animal. Uh -huh. Get it? Um, both dreams, both my marathon dream and Daniel's monster dream, are about how do we persevere to the finish when we're under pressure. For Daniel, the form that the pressure takes are these four monsters that we saw. You can go to commentaries and read scholarly suggestions about who those monsters are. Uh, many think that they are ancient empires like Babylon and Persia and Greece. And, uh, but there's also a lot of ambiguity about it. You can, uh, there's a, the details are really unclear, and scholars tend to often be really unsure about what the details mean, or they tend to just um, apply them to whatever sort of political situation they themselves disapprove of. But, and it actually, when, if, if you keep reading in, in Daniel 7, you'll find that Daniel asks, uh, what the heck is all of this about? And the interpretation given to him is only that these, are, these four beasts represent four kings that will rise uh, in the earth. So it's not exactly like they're specifically naming names here. And yet there are some things that are really unambiguous. For all of the lack of clarity, the one thing is clear is that these beasts are a threat, right? Like, this isn't just lions and tigers and bears, oh my. This is like lions with wings, and that stand on two feet and think like a human. It's a bear that's been told to eat everything it can. There's a, a four-headed leopard bird. There's a creepy talking horn with eyeballs. Like, you're not going to get any stuffed animals for your kids of uh, four-headed leopard birds, I don't think. These aren't cuddly images. So what's clear is that this pressure is a threat. It is uh, something that is frightening and that these empires exert powerful and negative influence upon the people of God. That much is clear. And, and the vision is sort of saying to Daniel, this is your reality, and this is going to be your reality. There's four of them that come and go. So this is this long and sustained reality of, of pressure in the, from these empires. And I, and I think that we have that same reality. It might not be that we're worried about uh, a Babylonian empire, uh, but what's really the problem, even in the ancient world, about these, these foreign kingdoms is not so much the ethnicity of the king who is on the throne, but rather all of the cultural pressure that comes along with it. There's all kinds of social and religious expectations. There's all kinds of new laws that, emer that, that come about that that put pressure on the people of God and put them at risk of forgetting who they are and who God is. And in that sense, I think we have a lot in common. We have our own beasts and monsters that, that emerge, don't we? I mean, what keeps, you, what keeps you up at night? What are the anxieties that run through your head? So you're heading out on a new school year. Maybe it's the pressure that you feel to fit in with the right group of friends or to stand out and be really different. Maybe there's pressure that you experience uh, in, in, in terms of finances, that you're trying to so hard in our affluence-driven society to keep up with the Joneses who are themselves trying to keep up with the Kardashians and who knows who they're trying to keep up with, but maybe there's a sort of a social pressure in general that you experience in our world of Instagram filters where everything needs to look really great from the food that we eat to the friends that we're with to the amount of likes that we get that just are causing us so putting so much pressure on us and really increasing our anxiety our stress our sense of self-worth these beasts are real and they affect us just as surely as the political empires that affected the people of God. There's no joke, and they put us at risk of forgetting who we really are and who God is and who he's calling us to be. I found a humorous example of one, one form of this pressure that we experience in our culture, 
and it uh, is about how to be a parent. I found this online, and maybe you saw it too, but it said, how to be a parent in 2017. So parents, pay attention here, because this is going to be important. Uh, it goes like this. This is all you have to do. Make sure that your children's academic, emotional, psychological, mental, spiritual, physical, nutritional, and social needs are met while being careful not to overstimulate, understimulate, improperly medicate, helicopter, or neglect them in a screen-free, processed foods-free, GMO-free, negative energy-free, plastic-free, body-positive, socially conscious, egalitarian, but also authoritative, nurturing, but also fostering of independence, gentle, but not overly permissive, pesticide-free, two-story, multilingual home, preferably in a cul-de-sac with a backyard and 1.5 siblings spaced at least two years apart for proper development, and also don't forget the coconut oil. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Except uh, I was noticing recently, I saw an article that apparently coconut oil is no longer okay. It's bad. So that kingdom has risen and fallen. So already this is out of date. Uh, the, the little internet meme goes on to describe how to be a parent in literally every generation before ours. It goes like this. Feed them sometimes. <laughs> we laugh. We laugh, but if you look around at the uh, parents among us, you might find that, might see them laughing with that kind of maniacal, crazy kind of laugh, like the kind of laugh of somebody who's about to start crying, because these are actually real pressures on parents, and it's not just on parents, but our culture is, su surrounds us with all of these expectations of how things are supposed to go and how we're supposed to do it, and there's all these basically rules that emerge, these new laws that come from these cultural monsters that uh, emerge out of the sea, and uh, they really do affect the way we live. And it's not just for parents, but you can find your own example of how to get ahead in the world, or how to succeed at work, or, or how to, you know, students have this from a very early age when they need to, you know, there's pressure to get in the right reading group or whatever, and then you got to also be on the traveling team and play an instrument and you know, have a uh, 100,000 friends on Facebook and have 160 likes every time you post a picture. You're supposed to be with the right crowd of people. You're also supposed to be pretty and funny and polite, and then it just keeps going when you get into your summer job. You need to find the right summer job so that you can, uh, so that you can get into the right college, and so then you get in the right college. Then you need the right internship so that you can get the right graduate program, and it just never ends, and these pressures eat us alive. And so Daniel is given this vision, and he says, this is how it's going to be. And it's amazing because he's not given any kind of solution that we might expect. He's just told that these kingdoms are going to rise, they're going to fall. They're going to rise, they're going to fall. There's going to be all kinds of pressure on you as the people of God, and it's going to change, but, but you're going to find yourself in difficult situations where you're going to be at risk, and you're going to have to really hold firm. There's no strategy given for how to defeat these monsters. There's no promise made that he's going to remove the monsters. It's a naming of the reality that he's going to have to be, that the people of God are going to need to be faithful under the pressure. What is given is not so much a strategy or a program, but a promise. A promise that there is something bigger than the monsters, something beyond the monsters. There's, gonna, there's, there's a kingdom that will not fall. And that's what Daniel is invited to look at. Look beyond the monsters, look beyond the struggle to, to the finish line. And what we see there is this, this image of the Ancient of Days. Somehow our, our, our vision, Daniel's vision, is kind of pulled up from the monsters coming out of the sea to, to what's going on in the heavens. And there's the Ancient of Days, and he's incredibly powerful, described with all kinds of imagery of power and might and, and wisdom. And he then is presented with this image, this, this son of man, this, this one like a son of man who's, who's granted authority and power and dominion. And it's somehow this kingdom that's going to withstand and last 
far beyond all of the earthly kingdoms that rise and fall. Somehow, just knowing that that's, that kingdom is out there, and that that's the kingdom that counts, and that that's the destination of the people of God, is, is going to sustain and keep them um, faithful and help them to persevere through all of those, all of those kingdoms. There's no, there's no way out that God is giving them, but he's inviting them to look at the kingdom that will never be destroyed, and, and to put their, their hope in that. This son of man is a really interesting image, um, especially at that time, because it's, it's kind of like interesting that he's, he's just described, after describing all these horrifying, scary monsters, there's one that's just, it's just like a son of man. It's just like a normal man. And yet, at the same time, even though he's, he's sort of a, he's a normal human being, like a son of man, he's also somehow coming from the cloud. So there's something divine about him, there's something human about him, and he comes in, and, and God is granting him a kingdom that's not just his, but to be shared with, with all of the people. If you keep reading in chapter 7, you'll see that this kingdom is to be shared with all the people of God, that, that this son of man is, is like a representative of all the people of God. He's like standing, standing in for them and establishing the kingdom on their behalf. And so it's no surprise that when Jesus begins his ministry. One of the favorite terms, one of the favorite titles and names that he has for himself is the Son of Man. It's capturing this this image that comes from Daniel chapter 7, this promise of God's faithfulness through and on the other end of all of these monsters that come and go and rise and fall. And in fact, at the end of Jesus' ministry, there's this amazing moment when he's being um, put on trial his disciple Mark remembered it and wrote this when he was writing about Jesus' life. This comes in Mark chapter 14, that the high priest asks Jesus, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? Jesus says, I am. And then he says this, and see if you can like, pick up on the reference. You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is straight out of Daniel 7, this image. And the high priest, who's the Bible scholar at the time, gets it. He gets it very clearly, and he makes him so mad and upset that he tears his clothes, and he says, why do we even need to go on with this trial? Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And everyone agrees that he's worthy of death. The most unlikely uh, solution to the problem of all of these empires that are controlling and dictating the people of God. And, and so these priests are like, this isn't, you can't be the solution to this. You can't, you, you're not what we were waiting for. And I think so often that's what we think too, when we're confronted with the like, monsters that are putting pressure on us, that are cr- creating anxiety and stress in our own lives. We, we look at, we hear the stories about Jesus and we're like, I don't see how, how this man is going to defeat these monsters in my life. I just, I don't see it. There's this huge contrast in the, in the text between these, like, incredibly scary monsters and then this just frail but yet somehow divine son of man. And we're, we don't understand how he's going to defeat them. And what's interesting is the, the condemnation that they gave, the death that Jesus died, is actually the defeat of all of these monsters. That's what it symbolizes, where Jesus actually goes and confronts the greatest monster of them all, death itself, and he conquers over it. He defeats it and destroys it and destroys all of those other monsters with him when he ri- with it when he rises from the dead. And so then Jesus rises from the dead and he says famously in the Great Commission, having been risen from the dead, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We don't often think about the echoes that has with Daniel 7, but it's there, right? All authority has been given to me. And, and then he says, I will be with you until the very end of the age. I'm going to be with you until that finish line. And so for us, on the other side of the, of the cross and the empty tomb, our promise is not just that at the end, the Son of Man will be waiting for us if we can make it through all these monsters. Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit on those who trust in him and follow him and is present with his people all along the way as well. So the God who promises in Daniel to be there at the end of it all, 
who's going to withstand all of those monsters and pressures and, and all that would cause us to forget who we are and who God is. The same God who promises to be there at the end with a kingdom that will never fail is the God who promises to be with us in the midst of it all as we live under the pressures of the kingdoms that will eventually fail. This is what actually, this is the hope that we are given. This is the vision that, that, that is given to help God's people live through the pressures that the world continues to place on us. And what's, I think, amazing about this is it helps us to actually be real about our future because we know what, what our ultimate destination is and that can define us, that can have the last word, and not these, not these monsters and all of the messages that our culture sends to us. But it also, th this hope then transforms the way we live in the midst of it. Uh, the pastor Tim Keller has written this about hope, and I think it's a really helpful idea. He says, human beings are hope-shaped creatures. The way you live now is completely controlled by what you believe about your future. This is true in, in all kinds of different ways. But if we, if we sort of know that the end game is, is going to be good, if we have hope in that, then, then we have all the more energy to persevere through hard times. Whereas if we're not sure that how things are going to work out, then, then those monsters loom much larger, and it seems much scarier, and, and we're not sure what to do. I was thinking about this in terms of dreams. Have you ever had one of those experiences? This hardly ever happens to me also, but where you kind of halfway know that it's a dream, that you're like kind of awake enough to realize that this is a dream. I think they call it lucid dreaming, maybe. It's the best because you're like having this scary dream, and then you're like, oh, I think I, think I might be sleeping now. I think this is a dream, so I think I'll just lie. It totally changes the circumstances. And I think that in the same way, when you know what your real reality is, when you know what your real circumstances is, the, the world that you're going to be living in into eternity, then it, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of how we live with the pressure of these monsters because we know they're not ultimately going to last. It sh it, it, and one of the things that I think frees us up, it frees us up to hope in a better future, and it also minimizes these monsters because we know what ultimate reality will look like. And, and because they're minimized, we can actually name them. We, we can actually get some distance from them and say, oh, th this monster is actually something that I can identify. This anxiety is something that I can point to and name. And I know it's not going to control me because it doesn't actually define me because it's not actually my destination. So we're actually free to be more honest and real about the struggles that we're facing when we know they don't define us. We can... We don't have to live in denial about these monsters of cultural pressure, but we also don't have to be in despair about them because we know that we have a bright hope, and that hope has come in the form of the Son of Man and the kingdom that he brings. And so as we're at the, at the, at the beginning of a, of a new school year where whether we're in school or not, rhythms change in the fall, summer vacation is over, but we're, we're heading into this, this new season where the pressures of our culture and our society are going to emerge. And what we have the opportunity to do is to decide whether they will define us or whether uh, we will be defined by this vision of Daniel and the promise of the Son of Man who has actually come and defeated them on our behalf. So whatever the pressures that you're experiencing or, or the pressures that are on the horizon, one thing this vision tells us is true is that they're going to keep coming. Monsters will rise out of the sea this year. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be heartbreak for us. And, and the promise that God is giving is, is not necessarily that he's going to relieve that pressure, but that there is a promise that will sustain us through it, if we put our trust, as Daniel was invited to, to do, to put, put our trust in that Son of Man, and that somehow that vision is going to pull us forward into the kingdom that will never be destroyed. And we too are invited 
to put our trust in that same Son of Man who invites us with nail-scarred hands to the wedding feast of the Lamb to put our trust in the kingdom, the King of the kingdom that will never be destroyed. Let's pray.